Recall that Mark chapter 2 ended with the row between Jesus and the Pharisees over his disciples picking grain on the Sabbath and Jesus ending up saying, Sabbath was made for the sake of man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He then continues in chapter 3 with another Sabbath-related episode. Modern chapter and verse breaks are not original to Mark. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched Jesus closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they could accuse him. So he said to the man who had the withered hand, Stand up in the middle. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or evil, to save life or destroy it? But they were silent. After looking around at them in anger, grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. So the Pharisees went out immediately and began plotting with the Herodians as to how they could assassinate him. This is another Marcian sandwich with the psychic interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees in between two halves of the withered hand story. This time the Pharisees say nothing. Mark says they are watching closely to see if Jesus would heal the man on the Sabbath. Jesus appears to know what they are thinking, gets the man to stand up, ready to be healed, and then asks them whether it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. They remain silent, Jesus heals the man, and the Pharisees go away to plot his death. It's not really clear why Mark put this in. It doesn't add anything to what we already know about Jesus. We've seen that he can read minds and heal visible disease, and this time there's no link to forgiveness. What is new about this one is that the man didn't come asking to be healed, he just happened to be in the temple, and likewise, the Pharisees didn't say anything at all. Historicists would argue that that is the kind of random detail that you get in a real history, rather than a story in which every element has a particular purpose. I'd be more sympathetic to that argument if we could accept it, but unfortunately, the story involves a supernatural event, so we know it didn't happen. Then we get a little testimonial of Jesus' fame from verse 7. And Jesus went with his disciples to the sea. A great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan River and around Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude came to him when they heard about the things he had done. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so the crowd would not press towards him. For he had healed many, so that all who were afflicted with diseases pressed towards him in order to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he sternly ordered them not to make him known. We've heard a lot of this before, the throngs, the healings, the unclean spirits who know who he is and who he tells to keep quiet. And then this odd addition of him being ready with a boat so that he can escape from the crowds. This is introducing a precedent that's going to be used later in the Gospel, but it's not developed further here. The next thing Mark covers is the disciples. Remember in chapter 116, Jesus calls Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, then James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And then in chapter 2, verse 14, Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Now Jesus went up to the mountain and called for those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve so that they would be with him and he could send them to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. To Simon he gave the name Peter. To James and his brother John, the sons of Zebedee, he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. And to Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So what happened to Levi the son of Alphaeus from chapter 2? James, the son of Alphaeus, appears this time. And Matthew and later Christians assert that Levi was another name for Matthew. Matthew does make this change, but it's not credible from Mark, who unambiguously introduces Levi, son of Alphaeus, only a few lines before this, and makes no hint of any connection between him, James or Matthew. It seems that Mark made a mistake, or Levi was called for some purpose other than being a disciple. After that disciple-choosing episode, Jesus is back on form gathering crowds, only this time it provokes the notorious comment from his family that he's out of his mind, and the less widely recognised fact that he goes on to give a classic psychiatric symptom known as flight of ideas. Verse 20 
Now Jesus went home and a crowd gathered so that they were not able to eat. When his family heard this, they went out to restrain him, for they said, He is out of his mind. The experts in the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. So he called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom will not be able to stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. And if Satan rises against himself and is divided, he is not able to stand, and his end has come. But no one is able to enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can thoroughly plunder his house. I tell you the truth. People will be forgiven for all sins, even all blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because, they said, he has an unclean spirit. So we have his family saying he's out of his mind. Then we get a second opinion from the experts who came down from Jerusalem, who said he's possessed by Beelzebub, by the ruler of demons, hence his ability to cast out demons. Then look at his parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? That's a fairly reasonable follow-on from the accusation that he's casting out demons by Satan's power. Then Jesus goes on, If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom will not be able to stand. If a house is divided against itself, it will not stand. If Satan rises against himself and is divided, he isn't able to stand and his end has come. So all of these talk to the same basic idea that Jesus is not casting out demons with Satan's power, because that would mean Satan was divided. But what happens then? But no one is able to enter a strong man's house and steal his property unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can thoroughly plunder his house. Jesus suddenly pivots theme to something that's peripherally connected, because he's talking about the strength of a house, and then he goes off on a superficial association to this other business about constraining the owner. Then he changes tack again. I tell you the truth, people will be forgiven for all sins, even all the blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, but is guilty of an eternal sin. So where did the Holy Spirit come from? The link seems to be the sin of burglary being forgiven. This hop from one thought to another with some kind of link between the thoughts is characteristic of the symptom of flight of ideas and that symptom is in turn characteristic of the psychiatric condition mania. Perhaps more familiar nowadays is the manic part of the manic depressive spectrum of disorders of affect. That's interesting because it allows us to add a third opinion. The family thought he was insane, professionals thought he was possessed by Beelzebub, but we can Ava with modern psychiatric knowledge that he was suffering from mania. I'm sure you've heard the magic mushroom theory, well, you never know. Anyway, Mark then wraps it all up at the end of the chapter. Verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and his brothers came, standing outside. They sent word to him to summon him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. He answered them and said, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who were sitting around him in a circle, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus is fastening his loyalty firmly to the circle of belief in him, rather than to his own family. It's also notable that Mark is using the same brother and sister motif that Paul was so fond of for brothers in Christ, and may well explain the controversial comment of Paul that James was the brother of the Lord. In passing, this was another Markian sandwich, with the family story on either side of the professional opinion and diagnostic data. Overall, there is a fairly strong steer in this chapter towards historicity, and that is the psychiatric paragraphs. Mark certainly makes it look as though he's picked up a pericope from somewhere. What we recognise as a mental illness is being interpreted as madness or devil possession. That does not mean this pericope came originally from a real Jesus, but wherever it came from, it certainly sounds like average humans interpreting madness as spirituality rather than capable humans crafting spirituality from scratch. 